We tried to think about most primitive information we have. Regarding our our extraordinary experience is that I think we choose the fact that all humanity has always been born naked, absolutely helpless for months, and though with beautiful equipment, as we learn later on, no experience, therefore absolute ignorance. That's where all humanity has always started. And we've come to the point where in our trial and error, finding our way, <laughs> stimulated by a designed in hunger, <laughs> designed in thirst. <laughs> These are conscious inputs, <laughs> designed in procreative urge. <laughs> we have plus an enormous amount of, as we learn later on, designed in automated <laughs> processing of the interrelationships of our, all the atoms in our organism, starting then with the, a consciousness of the hunger, <laughs> giving a drive to go after, <laughs> and to seek, to experiment. Man having then <coughs> no rule book, <laughs> nothing to tell him about that universe, <laughs> has had to really find his way entirely <laughs> by trial and error. He had no words, <laughs> had no experience to assume the other person had an experience. <laughs> had at first very incredibly limited way of communicating. <laughs> we now know human beings being on our planet for probably three and a half million years, with, as far as we can see, not much physiological change, pretty much the same skeleton. And I what we can learn of human beings in their earliest recorded communicating in, in an important degree. People in India 5,000 years ago, China 5,000 years ago, were thinking very extraordinarily well in terms of what, anything we know about our experience, the way we've been able to resolve the experiences into the discovery of principles that seem to be operative in our universe. I'm, I'm astonished at how well the early Hindu Chinese thinker, how well he was able to process his information in view of the very much, very limited amount of information humanity had as of that time com in, in comparison to anything we have today. Just making a little jump on information, as we as humanity on board of our planet entered into what it called World War I, <laughs> the scientists around the world have ways of reporting to one another f officially, and chemists have what they call chemical abstracts. Uh, the chemical abstracts are methodical publication of anything and everything any chemist finds that he publishes information regarding it, which comes in chemical abstracts. <laughs> as a world entering World War One uh, in the 20th, what's recorded in the 20th century, it's a very arbitrary kind of a counting matter, we had some hundred, I think it was hundred, uh, I'm doing this off the top of my head, my, my memory, about 175,000 known substances, possibly almost a quarter of a million substances by the time the United States came in the war known to chemistry. But we came out of World War I with almost a million substances known. <laughs> By the time we entered World War II, we were well up into 10 million. <laughs> and we've come out of it now where we, the, the figure is really getting me astronomical. <laughs> we can't really keep track of the rate which we're discovering more. Just talk about differentiable substances, <laughs> the chem chemically distinct from one another. Those, those are typical of the information Really, it's a, it's, a, it's a bursting, bursting rate now in, in, in relation to just 
I'm speaking in relation to my own life, one, one life and the, and, the, and the extraordinary numbers of lives there must have been on board of our planet. That the information is in, in multiplying that rate during just one lifetime <laughs> indicates that something is going on here right now that is utterly unprecedented and we're in such indicates an acceleration <laughs> of experiences as human beings, the integration of the accelerated, the experienced to produce awarenesses that are indicative of humanity going through some very, very important kind of transition into some kind of new relationship to universe, I'd say. That the kind of acceleration that would occur after the child has been formed in the womb, <laughs> taking the nine months, and, and, and then suddenly begins to issue from the, from the womb <laughs> out in, into an entirely new world. So I think we're, we're apparently coming through out of some common womb <laughs> of designedly permitted ignorance, <laughs> given faculties which we gradually discover and learn to employ by trial and error. <laughs> and we're at a point where I've, I now have what would also seem absolutely incredible to generations before. I've now completed 37 circuits of our Earth, kind of zigzagging circuits, not, not straight around, not tourists, just responding to requests to, to appear here and there to lecture at universities or to design some structure, whatever it may be. So <coughs> that, that, that is in the everyday pattern that, that I'm circuiting that earth. Certainly makes it in evidence that we are dealing in a, a totality of humanity, not the, or up to, up to my generation, completely set, divided humanity, spread very far apart on our planet where my father was in the leather importing business in Boston, Massachusetts, the United States. And he ported from two places primarily, the Buenos Aires and the India for bringing in leathers for the shoe industry, of, of, which was centered at that time in, in the Boston area. And his mail or a trip that he would like to make to Argentina took two months each way. And his trips to India and the mail took exactly three months each way. And it was very, seemed absolutely logical to humanity when early in this century, Rudyard Kipling, the English poet, said, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> the, the very, very rare matter for any human being to make such a travel as that, taking all those months. There were not many ships that could take him there. All that has just changed in my lifetime to where it's a <coughs> I'm not just one of a very few making these circuits of the earth, but I'm, I'm one of, of probably getting to be pretty close to 20 million now who are making, living a life like that around our planet. And very much the whole young world doing so. I, I keep meeting my students at various universities from around the world, halfway around the world again. They're, they're, they're all getting to be living as world people. So this is a very sudden emergence into some new kind of relationship to our universe that's being manifest. None of it was planned. There was nobody in the time of my father, my mother, as I was brought up, the pro prophesying any of the things I just said. When I was, the year I was born, Marconi invented the wireless, but it did not get into any practical use until I was 12 years of age when the first steamship sends an SOS that's in distress by wireless, just think of it. Great many miles and the world began to know the ship was in distress you know, and ships began to rush to its aid. <laughs> Absolutely unexpected. My, my father and mother would say wireless, such nonsense. And when I was three, the electrons discovered, and nobody talked about that. There wasn't in any of the newspapers, or nobody's interested in electrons. Didn't know where this electron was been discovered. The, I was brought up that the humanity would never get to the North Pole, <laughs> absolutely impossible, and never get to the South Pole. <laughs> and our Mercator maps didn't even show anything up here. The, 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 the northernmost points were very rugged, r r kind of a line, but you didn't see it, no anything up beyond that. When I was 14, man did get to the North Pole. When I was 16, he got to the South Pole. So the impossibles were happening. Like all other little, little boys, I was making 
paper darts which you could make at school. But boys must have been making them for a very long time. And we were hoping we might be able to get to flying. <laughs> but the parents, your parents said, darling, it's very, very, very amusing for you to try that, but it's inherently impossible for a man to fly. So when I was seven, the Wright brothers suddenly flew. <laughs> and I, I'm, I, my memory is vivid enough of seven to remember that the, for about a year, the engineering societies were trying to prove it was a hoax. It was absolutely impossible for a man to do that. So then, not only was that, that radio, but when I was 23, which is what you think, I guess many in this room are not 23 yet. <laughs> when I was 23, the human voice came over the radio for the first time. <laughs> and that's an incredible matter. When I was 27, we had the first licensed radio broadcasting. <laughs> When I was 38, I was asked to go on a, an experimental TV studio program in New York where the Columbia Broadcasting had 70 sets, which in the in various scientists and their board of directors' homes, and, and they had experimental programs going out, and so I, they didn't have any money for paying anybody. The man who ran it, Gilbert Seldes, a friend of mine, ran the studio, and so I often appeared on his program, but we don't have television operating in the United States until after World War II. So we, we're talking about, I was, I was 40, 45 when we had our first television. So this very, could be more recent matter. And yet, and nobody thought at that time we were going to have, they didn't know you were going to have transistors. They didn't know you were going to have man was going to have satellites going around on Earth. We didn't know how we were going to have radio relay satellites. That we were going to be able to have programs coming to any, coming out of any part of the Earth, go any other part of the Earth. Absolutely. Not one of these steps was ever anticipated by any of the others. So that having experienced that, I also have experienced living with my fellow human beings who I find no sooner has it happened than he said, I knew it all the time. I'm not one of those to be surprised, I was sort of in on it, you know. I'm, I was a little bit responsible. And th there, was a, there was a strange vanity of man, and I think the vanity that he has was essential to his being born naked and helpless <laughs> and having to make the fantastic number of mistakes he had to make in order to really learn something. And I think he'd been so disgruntled, <laughs> so dismayed by the, the mistakes and the errors <laughs> that he would never been able to carry on. He would just been absolutely discouraged, so he was given a strange vanity to say, continually sort of make him himself an exempt, <laughs> and that he, was, he, he was some kind of privilege and, and uh, always in. And he was able to then quite clearly deceive himself a great deal. So I find everybody today, so he's going, get, get in the mood and anybody do that, that's absolutely simple and logical. Now, there, it is obvious and simple and logical, provided you were born, and this has happened in your lifetime, you can see how it happened. I began to realize with that rapid changing going on, which was, I was antis uh, not anticipated, <coughs> that what people call natural when I was young, the natural related to a state before these great changes occurred, where we was, were supposed to stay we were inherently remote from other human beings. <laughs> no way you could get the other human beings. And all the custom been developed over millions and millions of years of, of tribes and, and com little communities being isolated one from the other. The, how you got on with one another, seeing everybody, you saw everybody a great deal all the time. The conditions that were really brought, brought about by that constant proximity, <laughs> brought about human behaviors, which we have now rules, and everybody said that, the older people say that's where you carry on, that are really no longer germane to the c conditions that are prevailing. And I began to realize that this, uh, that Chris is, to me, having been born before flying for the Wright brothers, 